interject from my, my text. There we go. Thanks. So that was an interjection that we're recording. Is okay, and we are recording this meeting. Thanks very much, Natalie. Um, now, uh, part of tonight's forum is going to be about how we can organize ourselves to respond to this crisis. So after we hear from tonight's uh, speakers, there will be a section on how all of us can contribute to building a province-wide movement to strengthen Medicare because we have some very big challenges ahead of us. And so I'll not now introduce our five speakers who um, uh, was starting with Dr. Raghu Venagopal, who's an emergency doctor working at St. Joseph's Hospital. He's working there right now as we uh, speak. And uh, he also works at the Toronto General Hospital. And uh, next we'll hear from uh, Karen Mackay Eden, who's a registered nurse with decades of experience, most recently working at Mount Sinai Hospital. She's currently the regional vice president for the greater Toronto area of the Ontario Nurses Association. And then we'll hear from Nicole Payette Kiriluk. Is, she's a mother and advocate for the Ontario Disability Coalition, whose 10 year old daughter, Alexa, was born with a neurodegenerative disorder and receiving, um, is receiving palliative care. Charles LaBelle is a paramedic um, in the greater Toronto area. And Natalie Mara uh, will be our last speaker. She's the uh, executive director of the Ontario Health Coalition, has been for 22 years. She's built the Health Coalition into the largest and broadest public interest group on healthcare in the province, representing more than three quarters of a million Ontarians in its network of more than 500 member organizations and more than 50 local chapters. Um, she's a, a former board member of the Canadian Health Coalition, where she spearheaded numerous national campaigns to safeguard, safeguard and improve single-tier public Medicare. Uh, so welcome to all of our speakers, and I'm going to hand it over right now to Dr. Venegopal. Thank you. I'm, I'm really grateful to our moderator and the coalition and all of our participants today because we must act and now is the time. Um, I, I can't speak for any one hospital, but I'll speak as a physician um, and with uh, the stories my patients uh, encounter that typifies and illustrates the crisis we are facing. You know, um, we're fighting for people of all political persuasions, you know, when the coalition and us voice our concerns in the public, in the media, we're fighting for all Ontarians and we're fighting for all Canadians. And so that is the concern that I bring. But, you know, to really to really describe what I am seeing and what my patients are experiencing, I have had patients coming by ambulance with chest pain who have waited eight hours. And I made a careful note of how long it took. It took eight hours for that patient to get an EKG. And I was so incensed by that that I wrote the hospital chief executive officer to make sure that they were aware, but that is unconscionable. And, and that's in the past two weeks. Um, I've had patients under my direct care wait five days, uh, five full days on an ER stretcher uh, waiting for admission to hospital. I've had patients wait five hours for basic blood work. I've had children wait four hours for Tylenol and Advil. Um, I will see patients on paramedic stretchers um, during my shift and because they're on a stretcher and that's kind of like a middle area where neither the hospital nor the paramedics can take full responsibility. It's really the paramedics and myself. I will see that patient on a paramedic stretcher and nothing will get done because the hospital hasn't taken ownership and no scans, no blood work, no x-rays, no treatments will be administered unless the patient is critically ill. And so these are just a few vignettes to really um, highlight what our moderator has said is that our publicly funded healthcare system is in crisis. And, you know, I really do want to frame my brief comments in the context of today's huge victory um, where public health advocates like ourselves today, you know, we took to the streets and nurses and other health professionals and the public fought that battle and they won that battle. And I think that's a very inspiring message today, registered nurses and uh, um, nurse um, practitioners and registered practical nurses and other professionals, they fought that battle. They were in the streets. They were at Queen's Park. Um, nurses and other professionals uh, spoke to the media. Um, they, the public knows Bill 124 and how anti-social and how anti-public that was. And as a physician, you know, I did my humble part. I 
join the nurses in the streets. I join them at Dundas Square. I join them at Queen's Park. Um, but really, we need a chorus of voices, um, members of the public. But I, I think it's a very hopeful message that our voices matter and that the courts and the public listen. And, and, and I'm very inspired also with how our, our uh, educational professionals have conducted themselves, making the current government back down in the face of public outcry. And so although this government has a strong mandate and they are at the beginning of their mandate, um, our voices matter. And just because they have a mandate doesn't mean they can make bad policies. And we are seeing a number of very bad provincial policies uh, that are affecting patients. Um, it, it is wrong that we treat our vulnerable um, adults and vulnerable patients by sending them far away to a nursing home. It is, it is patently wrong. It is not their fault. They shouldn't be the scapegoat. Um, at the same time, we have a crisis in the ERs. Um, and I apologize that I'm not staying longer today just because I'm in the middle of the shift and we're, we're down a doctor. Um, and so, you know, we have to come in early and stay late because when as a province, we don't take these respiratory infections seriously. When we don't have things like a mask mandate, which I favor, especially in schools and indoor settings, um, when that's not mandated, we see respiratory viruses run amok. And the reality is, and I'll conclude with this comment, is that we're all in it together. When children get sick and need hospitalization, that reduces our capacity to help adults and to help senior citizens. And when senior citizens in nursing homes face outbreak, that reduces hospital capacity to admit children. And so the majority of hospitals in Ontario are general hospitals. They're not super specialized pediatric or super specialized adult hospitals, they're general hospitals. And we care for everyone from, from birth to death. And so we have to uh, bear that in mind. And I really look forward to working with the coalition to put pressure on policymakers. I apologize to put pressure on policymakers to try and change some of the policies that really are harming the, the public good. I'd be happy to take any questions um, to further highlight the situation um, or to give like some frontline testimony. Thank you so much, Dr. Van uh, Do feel free at any time if you need to, uh, you know, mute or run off. We completely understand. And thank you so much for giving us your insights tonight. Um, and I think uh, just uh, I want to mention that uh, we also have tonight uh, with us a couple of members of provincial parliament. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Peter Tabbins and Chris Glover are the ones I see right now. So thanks very much for coming along uh, to this important uh, meeting tonight and for, for your support. Um, our next speaker then, uh, we'll move along right now to uh, Karen Mackay Eden. Uh, so please go ahead, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much, Michelle, and to the Ontario Health Coalition for organizing this important town hall. I'm a proud registered nurse and uh, the Ontario Nurses Association Vice President for Region 3, which is uh, Toronto. Ona represents over 68,000 nurses and healthcare professionals across the province, including 18,000 nursing students. I'm grateful to be here with you today and to have the opportunity to share what is happening in our healthcare system now and why we know privatization is not the answer. Here's one thing that is very clear. Doug Ford does not have the answers. We have the answers. Today, the Ontario court struck down Doug Ford's notorious Bill 124, which capped nurses and healthcare workers' wages at 1% per year. This disrespectful wage suppression pushed our healthcare system beyond the breaking point. As nurses and healthcare workers, we have appealed to the Ford time and time again to repeal this unjust law, and he refused making the crisis in our healthcare system worse as our members leave the profession in droves. Today's win in court is not only a huge victory for workers, but really creates an opportunity to do the right thing and invest in nurses and healthcare professionals. It's become commonplace for nurses to be kept at the hospital for hours after their shift is supposed to end because the next shift is short staffed and it's not possible to safely transfer patient care. We have nurses working on maternity floors that should have 35 RNs on a shift, but the new normal is 17 or 18. 
In Toronto, we have hospitals where there are more vacant RN positions than there are RNs on staff. We've seen kicked sick kids have to once again cancel surgeries because they don't have capacity. We know that nurses are resilient and resourceful. We always put patient care first. And even in these extremely difficult times, our members find ways to provide the care that they know all patients need and deserve. But the cost of this burden is taking its toll. Early retirements are going up. New grads are rethinking their careers and leaving after only one or two years on the job. Nurses are leaving to work at private agencies where they can ensure they have a good work-life balance. This is a real cost to our healthcare system as the situation worse, worsens. Ford took an understaffed system and made it so much worse by introducing Bill 124, which caps the wages of many nurses and healthcare professionals violating our charter rights. And now we have a court ruling upholding those rights. And Ford is refusing to work with healthcare professionals to invest and implement a meaningful retention and recruitment plan, leaving our system severely understaffed with no relief in sight. Instead, he wants to privatize. The most broken parts of our healthcare system are the ones that are already privatized, like our long-term care and our home care settings. Private health care will take away from public care by pulling resources and staff from the public system. As nurses, we have already seen this as colleagues have left the public system to go and work for private agencies. We can't let this happen. Ontario's public health care system is not Doug forced to dismantle and sell off to his corporate buddies. Our public health care system has been built up over generations, and that belongs to all of us. That's why the Ontario Nurses Association is here with you tonight and will continue to work hand in hand with our allies to fight for the investments we need in our public health care system so that everyone gets the care they need and deserve. Together, we can stop Doug Ford's plan in his tracks. Thank you for having me. Thank you very, very much, Karen. And uh, th that's uh, a lot for us to, to chew on. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate you participating in this tonight. Um, I'm now going to pass the floor over to Nicole Payette Kirillak. Good evening, starts. everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, I'm a parent of a medically fragile child who's 11 years old, who has a neurodegen neurodegenerative disorder that's similar to ALS and MS combined. She requires 24-hour care and uh, needs like help with everything. So suctioning, seizures, GJ tube fed, she's on a ventilator. Um, she just made her 11th birthday and we're so grateful for that. Um, but that has to do with um, the supports we have and the level of care she gets at home from her home care nurses, but also uh, previously from her hospital nurses at sick kids. Um, we're in a crisis. I don't know what to say and how to raise the alarm enough. Um, I'm representing families of some of the most complex, uh, medically fragile children in the population. Um, we have very few resources at home. We are providing primary care. We are resuscitating our children without nurses present. It's not okay. The system has completely collapsed. Um, we took Alexa to sick kids in September um, for an ER visit. Um, she typically gets um, uh, hospitalized every time she goes in because she's one of their most complex uh, patients. Uh, we're like, you know, it's like a revolving door. We spend a lot of time there over the last 10 years. And um, the level of care has deteriorated to the point where um, it became a safety concern for us, unfortunately. Um, they are an amazing hospital, but the lack of resources in our public health care system has depleted to the point where they just did not have the resources capable of supporting the patients that were there in the ER that day. We were there for 21 hours. Um, we, we waited hours for people to come in and check in on her, set up her ventilator, set up the oxygen. Um, she was dehydrated to the point where she had one dirty diaper while she was in the hospital. Um, it's just, again, lack of resources. I don't blame the nurses or the medical team. They were running around um, like crazy, but they were so overwhelmed. It was unbelievable. I've never seen this in the last like 11 years. This is the worst I've ever seen it. 
And I'm scared to death to have to take her back in because she's sick right now. Uh, because what is that going to mean? Um, again, um, it, it's overwhelming. I had uh, families that were there with us in rooms close by. They left the hospital because they felt that they could take care of them better at home. In the end, she was not hospitalized. Um, the medical team that we um, consulted with decided that she was safer at home, that she would get better care at home. That's like, that's a big deal for them to say that because they've never sent her home. She was, she's always been admitted. So um, again, they're triaging, but unfortunately there's not enough beds for everyone. And if you have supports at home, then you will be sent home. But as a parent of a child with medical complexities, it's scary because we don't always have nurses here at home. So that care falls onto the parents, the families, and that's where it's, it's devastating. Um, the other issue too is uh, that we're seeing is um, hospitals are bringing in privately paid nurses through agencies. They're working side by side with publicly funded nurses. And that creates a lot of tension and a lot of issues with staffing. And, and I've heard that from a lot of um, the nurses that we have that work in hospital where, you know, they're leaving their jobs because they feel like they're not being treated well uh, within their work environments because that discrepancy is happening when you're working side by side with every, everyone. Um, so all I wanted to say is, um, I don't know what we can do <laughs> at this point. Like, I've done a story with the Toronto store. My daughter's been presented at the legislature. I'm a strong advocate. <laughs> um, you know, I wrote a document, a policy brief on nine recommendations for home care solutions. What do parents have to do to hear, for the government to hear that we are in crisis, that we need help? How do families like myself, although, you know, in this forum, I'm able to vocalize what's happening, how are we able to make a difference, I guess, in, in this situation when elected officials are not willing to listen to us? Um, I've tried to connect with different elected officials and it, it's really hard to get through the front door. So I think, you know, everyone has to join together and use this forum and follow this action plan uh, that hopefully will get um, something done and changes made. But I think we have to be a, a united front in order to make a difference. Uh, so thank you everyone for everything and for listening and uh, to, to my daughter's story. Uh, but just know that there's a lot of us out there that are on our own and, and we need help. So please help. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, that's, uh, it's incredibly uh, you know, generous of you to give your time to talk to us about this in, the con in this condition. And we're so thankful to have you here and for all the work that you're doing. And uh, I will now uh, uh, hand the floor over to uh, Charles LaBelle, who is a paramedic uh, in Toronto. He's gonna talk about uh, some of his experiences. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you to the Health Coalition for having me as a guest tonight. I'm here representing paramedics of QP Local 416, employed by the City of Toronto. I've been a proud paramedic for 17 years, and it's been a privilege to serve the residents of the city. Unfortunately, these are unprecedented times. In my 17 years as a paramedic, I've not seen the kind of crisis we're witnessing today. I want to give you a glimpse of a typical workday for a paramedic to help you understand this crisis and what it means for paramedics and patients alike. The shift usually begins at 6 p.m. In normal times, we would inspect the equipment and the vehicle, go through the list of Ministry of Health requirements. But at 6.02, the tones will go off and 911 call is waiting for an ambulance. So lights and sirens and the shift starts. No time to check the equipment, the vehicle, the emergency is waiting. The mandatory check sheet falls by the wayside and the Ontario Ministry requirements will have to wait. We might get them done tomorrow. The call details will come in and it's a person with shortness of breath. I'm going for three days, couldn't hold off any longer. Arrive at the patient's home. She's been to the hospital multiple times in the last month for chronic asthma, but she can't get any relief. We provide medicine, make her feel better, help her onto the stretcher, and to the emergency we go. Arriving at the hospital, we are greeted with eight ambulances lined up at the air entrance. It's going to be a long wait. Walking through the waiting room, patients are lined up at the triage. Chairs are stuffed with sick people, loved ones. They have a look of despair as another stretcher is coming through. 
Little do they know that our patient's gonna be waiting with them. The nurse behind the desk is exhausted and she won't even make eye contact with us. She can't handle yet another EMS patient. Our patient is placed in the hallway with all the others. I recall Ford announcing the end of hallway medicine back in 2018. It was pretty ugly then. We used to have four patients lined up in stretchers in the hallway. These days, it's not uncommon to have 12 in the corridor. We head back to the ambulance, start the paperwork, clean the vehicle. The 20 minutes afforded to us is cut short and dispatch needs another ambulance. An elderly, elderly person who suffered a fall. They've been waiting four hours, maybe a broken hip. Off we go, but unfortunately this person is gonna to have to wait a little longer. A higher priority call will come in and the cycle continues. One emergency after the other until end the shift. No breaks, no lunches. That's the standard. So why is this happening? There's just not enough paramedics. Because of insufficient funding from the provincial and municipal governments, we're chronically understaffed and overworked. The province and the city of Toronto equally split funding for paramedic service. In Toronto, we went 10 years without hires above attrition. During the same period, 911 calls for paramedics went up by 4.5% annually. In other words, our workload increased by 45% with no increase in resources. No wonder we have so many paramedics getting injured and burnt out. It's led to recruit, recruitment and retention challenges. Who would want to work in an environment that exploits our emotional, physical, mental labor day after day? Naturally, understaffing, understaffing has a big impact on patient care. If there's, no shortage of, if there's a shortage of paramedics, there's a shortage of ambulances. Often the situation is critical when there are zero ambulances available to respond to 911 calls. And let me share a personal story with you. Uh, one early morning, we were called for a person who suddenly went into cardiac arrest. And while responding to the emergency, another 911 call came in. Another patient was having a heart attack. Mine was the only ambulance available in that district. So the person I was closer to got the ambulance and the next closest ambulance was coming from Durham region. This type of situation is becoming increasingly common in Toronto, as it is across Ontario. There's a growing frequency of zero ambulance availability. There's no standard term for this type of occurrence, but you may have heard of code reds or code blacks on the news. In 2021, over 1,100 incidents of zero ambulance availability happened in Toronto. It's unacceptable. The people of our city deserve better. Even when the Toronto Paramedics Services isn't in a code red situation, there are not enough ambulances available to respond to patients in a timely fashion. Our average response time to the emergency call is about 13 minutes. Even though the optimal time for survival is about six minutes for such events as heart attacks, traumas, and strokes. Clearly we need more staffing, but we also need the province to invest in our overwhelmed healthcare sector. Over the past few years, the interconnected crisis across the system from hospitals to long-term care, to home care, to emergency medical service, services have only intensified. The dedication of doctors, nurses, personal support workers, and all the other staff are the only reason the system hasn't completely collapsed. Healthcare workers are struggling and we need help. We need more public support to put pressure on politicians. I urge you to get involved with the Health Coalition to fight along, alongside us to improve our public health care system. We need support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. It's really an important voice to hear. And we've heard so much of that on the news about the, uh, the lineups of ambulances and so on. And uh, hearing it directly from frontline front workers is, uh, is essential, I think. Um, I'm now going to introduce Natalie Mera, the executive director of the Ontario Health Coalition, who's going to, uh, I think, bring all this picture together. And then we'll have time for some questions and uh, discuss organizing. Go ahead, Natalie. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you to all the speakers. Boy, it's overwhelming to hear it. And, you know, this is... I, I just think it's hard to capture in words the extent to, it's it's almost impossible to overstate the extent to which the healthcare system is in crisis. Crisis doesn't even really capture it anymore. It really is um, 
it's it's like it's collapsing in in ways because care even the most urgent of care you know isn't being provided isn't able to be provided nicole described her daughter waiting for two hours for a ventilator that's her breathing equipment in the emergency department at sick kids one of the you know world renowned public hospital that we should be so proud of you know in that situation um you know patients going without food or water for 21 hours while they're waiting or medication if they didn't bring their own you know all of that it's just unbelievable a mo you know a, more than a thousand code zero incidents um for ambulances in the last year from this summer to this fall we've had almost 100 emergency department closures across ontario because there aren't enough staff to keep the emergency departments open the emergency departments in the local hospitals we've had icus closed intensive care units closed there is no more urgent level of care than emergency care and um, critical care units, uh, intensive care units, to have them closed uh, is just, uh, you know, it is absolutely a catastrophe for um, the health system. And yet, what is bizarre in all of this is that in the summer, the Minister of Health refused to say that there was a crisis. Actually, she tried to pretend that it was normal to have emergency department closures, you know, 80 some odd emergency department closures across the province uh, in the summer. I've done this for 22 years, we uh, 27 years actually. We've tracked the cuts, we've tracked closures, we fought off closures, et cetera, across the province. There has never been, never in the history of this province has there been uh, 80 emergency department closures across Ontario. There was one that I couldn't recall 10 years, uh, it was 13 years ago in Seaforth for a few weeks. There may have been an occasional other one in a smaller community where they had a staffing shortage. Nothing, nothing on this scale. To today, the minister has yet to admit that there is a crisis even in the hospitals. And I have to say that crisis exists in long-term care for those people who are living and working in long-term care, it's in home care. I mean, it's across the board. Leading into the pandemic, Ontario had come off of uh, almost 30 years straight of cutting our hospitals, of downsizing our hospitals. It's purposeful policy in Ontario. We had, we have the fewest hospital beds left of any province in the country. It's measured per person. How many hospital beds do you have per person? And I should say, a hospital bed is just a piece of furniture without staff, right? This is a. These are beds that are staffed and in operation. And Ontario has the fewest per person of any province in Canada. Riley, can we share the screen and just show people? So you can see from the top um, chart there, Ontario's dead last in the country and um, considerably below the provincial average. It's a bit easier to see in the bottom. There we are, the, the bottom bar in the bottom um, graph. Um, and we're about half of what the provinces with the highest number of beds per capita have. So to the east of us, all the provinces have, uh, except for Quebec, have more hospital beds per person than we do. And we're about one bed short per thousand. So we have 15 million people in Ontario. That's 15,000 thousands. We're 15,000 hospital beds short of the average of the rest of Canada. Okay, you can stop sharing there for a minute. So just putting this into context, Ontario is normally is the average of the country. <laughs> we have the largest population, right? We've got about a third of the population of Canada. And so we're norm we normally carry the average of the country. In this case, we're dead last. And actually, I plotted us against the entire OECD. That's, um, you know, all of the quote unquote developed nations on earth. And there's only two countries with fewer hospital beds left than Ontario has, Mexico and Chile. Our European peers have you know, most of them, many of them double the number of hospital beds that we have per person. This was a plan. Every piece 
of hospital service that has been cut from public hospitals has been privatized. All the chronic care beds that were cut under the Harris government, they were um, uh, turned into long-term care beds and handed off to for-profit companies. Ontario is the only province that has a majority long-term care um, that is for-profit. 67% of our long-term care beds are for-profit. And I just have to note that both Mike Harris uh, and his um, uh, uh, successor, Ernie Eves, both went on to join boards of for-profit long-term care companies when they left office after cutting all those chronic care hospital beds. Then we just sort of kept the level of beds at that state for the next entire period. The uh, There was a little bit of opening up um, as, uh, as the Harris government was under pressure from the crisis that they created. The Liberals got in and they froze. First, they ran hospital budgets at less than the rate of inflation for Oh, I think it was about six years and then, uh, no, not quite, a few years, and then they froze them for 10 years. Uh, and uh, and so the population grew, inflation went up, but hospitals had to shed services and cut in order to uh, meet at what was then legislated that they couldn't have deficits anymore. So the whole plan was to downsize the public hospitals. Ontario now has the fewest nurses per patient, per average patient of any province in the country. Like by every measure, we're lower than the rest of the country. I just wanna show you one more. Can we show the hospital funding, Riley? Let's do it as a percentage of what are we looking at here, uh, GDP. So this is the measure of like affordability, right? What proportion of your economic output do you spend on, oh, this is healthcare as a total. So sorry, this is healthcare as a total. We're second last in the country, oopsie. And, and hospitals were dead last in the in the country. So in healthcare as a total, we're second from the bottom. In hospitals in particular, we're dead last in the country. That's as a proportion of our economic output. Let's look at it at per person, the next one, per capita. There we are. These are all on our website if you want to see them um, you know, in more detail. Again, we're dead last in the country in terms of public hospital funding. By every way of measuring it, we have dropped to the bottom of the country. I'm emphasizing this. Thanks, Riley. We can end that. Because it's a choice. These are political choices. Every other province does better than we do. Even the tiny provinces that are not as wealthy as we are do better than we do in terms of their hospital funding and actually in terms of healthcare funding in total. Um, and the reason is that Ontario has prioritized cutting taxes for the wealthy. Uh, tax cuts are always sold like they benefit the middle class. They always benefit the wealthy. That's what they're designed to do. And um, corporations. And so we're paying for it in a in a whole array of things, you know, high university fees, high college fees, you know, extra fundraising and all that stuff you have to do for schools, uh, high high charges for parks and recreation and so on, and healthcare, devastating cuts and downsizing of our public health care. It's not that we don't have the capacity. All across the province, there are entirely closed hospitals. There are closed floors and closed wards. You know, the beds exist, but they are not funded to be staffed. There are closed operating rooms all across Ontario. Every large uh, uh, hospital has operating rooms that are closed for weeks or months at a time or permanently because they haven't had the funding to run them. Leading into the pandemic, um, in the last couple of years of the uh, liberal government, they opened the purse strings a little bit. They opened, I think, about 3,000 um, hospital beds, or they said that they were going to. Um, I don't think they all materialized, but uh, in, in the end, that's what they, that they were doing in the last, just in the last two years. Too little, too late, um, but they had started in that direction. When the Ford government got in in 2018, it again cut hospital funding to below the rate of inflation, cut long-term care funding, cut public health funding, went after EMS, tried to uh, um, uh, restructure public health and EMS. And we were in really total chaos by the time that the uh, pandemic hit. We had no surge capacity. Pandemic hit and all the resilience in the system has now been burned through and we're in this situation. And what's absolutely outrageous about it is that our government is doing nothing, nothing 
about the crisis. I'm not overstating it. Um, you know, the media is complaining to me when I do interviews that every time they do a story about the emergency department overloads, they get the same speaking lines, the same PR lines from the government. We're hiring 6,000 staff. They say it over and over. They've said it for, what, two years now? Whether or not they hired that 6,000 staff, immaterial. I don't know if they did. No one could ever really track it. But at the end of the day, we're losing more than are coming in. That is definite. We're in a net loss position. Staff in healthcare don't have the right to strike generally, but they're voting with their feet and they're leaving. Bill 124, which is a, you know just a fork in the eye to people who have risked their lives for the last three years for all of us. And you know before, obviously their jobs always risk their lives, but on a totally different level, you know to have wage suppression legislation in the middle of that is just um, hideous. You know, it's just outrageous. But in addition to that, it's the workload it's how long could you ask a nurse or a health professional to work a 12 hour shift doing you know, the job of four um, and uh, not being able to provide care for people, having people yelling at them and, and threatening them and losing their um, tempers because they have to wait so long, having the violence increase around them, getting hurt at work in large numbers. Um, and then you know, every time they're off, we heard from a respiratory therapist who's working 70 hours a week. Those are the people that are intubating patients. And every time uh, he's off, he's getting called in to do overtime. I mean, it's not humanly possible and people can't live under that stress forever. And we're seeing the consequences of it. And so the flip side of that coin, the refusal to do anything substantive. Oh, I should say what we need, by the way, is about 56,000 staff in long-term care alone about just over 40,000 in the hospitals alone, and we don't know the numbers for home care, but so 6,000, if you bring in a couple of staff in a place that is completely overwhelmed, they don't stay, they leave because the workloads are impossible. Um, and that's what's happening. And so, uh, so the flip side of this, refusal to do anything to uh, address the crisis in the public system, even the very clear things they absolutely could do, um, is that the government actually doubled the funding in the spring for the for-profit clinics. So wouldn't do anything about the public hospitals, but handed uh, doubled the funding for the private clinics, even as they were lying to the public and telling, you know, we were warning that they were doing this and they were categorically denying it um, and telling the media that they were not expanding the private clinics. And then two months after the election, they announced their intention to privatize the hospitals. This is not a solution, by the way. This is the destruction of most communities would have spent the last hundred years fundraising, donating from their payroll, you know, volunteering, literally building up their local public hospitals to provide the services that their communities need. People of every political stripe. This is the dismantling of it. It's handing over to for-profit companies, the profitable surgeries and diagnostic tests that they wanna to take to make money from taking uh, the, and what they want are the, the ones that they make money from. So they're high volumes, easy patients, patients that are not all attached to all kinds of tubes and so on that are, you know, are going to be medically complex and require a whole bunch of staff. They're people who can walk in, walk out, do the surgery super quickly, get them gone. Uh, so they don't take, you know, like Shoulders, for example, the hernia hospital, many of you would have heard of that. So they won't take patients with COPD. They don't take people with diabetes or who are overweight or who might code on the operating room table. They take the healthy, uh, well patients who they can move through um, and because they don't have the complex and expensive facilities to provide for everyone. Um, and so what happens then in our public hospitals? If we lose staff and funding for the profitable patients, and leave the more expensive patients behind, our hospitals would be even more devastated than they are. This would be a stupid and terrible idea at the best of times. In these times, it is uh, a, a, a diabolical idea. It's dangerous, it's reckless. It will be the destruction of our local public hospitals. And the, the last point I just wanna make about privatization is, that the minister has said, oh, no, 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 quote unquote, you'll use your OHIP card. That's a very carefully crafted PR line. The truth is we phoned every private clinic in the country 
We've done it multiple times. We've done it four times in Ontario, twice across Canada, posing as patients. And we said, you know, if they're selling shoulder surgery, can we buy a shoulder? How much does it cost to get shoulder surgery at your clinic? Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we caught the majority of them, not a smattering, not just one or two. The vast majority of the private clinics that exist in Canada are charging patients for services. That is not allowed under the Canada Health Act. We paid in our taxes. We should get those services without charge. That is what we won when we won public Medicare in this country. And the prices are outrageous. 10 times the cost in a surgical clinic uh, for the shoulder surgery that it is uh, under uh, the BC, it's in British Columbia, the equivalent of OHIP. In Ontario, the cataract surgery clinics, the ophthalmologists charging $2,000 for cataract surgery, um, you know, in flagrant violation of the law in Canada, you can't do that. Uh, a surgery that's seven minutes and costs $550 under OHIP. And on top, they're charging all kinds of patients $200 for medically unnecessary eye measurement tests they pretend are medically necessary. And you can see why. If you had a thousand patients and you charge each of them $200 for extra add ons that you convince them to get, it's 200,000 extra dollars a year in your income. It's pure greed. And it's coming at the expense of the elderly mostly who are going to these clinics and trying to get services. And, um, and so they pose a real existential threat to the future of Medicare in this country. There are other choices. There is no question there are. Quebec, after the first wave, they aim to hire in 10,000 PSWs uh, because they had a devastating first wave of COVID-19, uh, worse than ours was even. Um, and what the government did it. They didn't hive it off like Ford is doing to private for-profit colleges and so on. The government did it. They paid them for training. They did intensive three-month training. They uh, increased their pay. They got them into the long-term care homes in time for the second wave. And they had a way better second wave. We actually had a way worse second wave. Thousands of people died here in, uh, in the second wave. And the government refused, absolutely refused to do that, despite the staffing, despite the fact that people were actually literally dying of starvation and dehydration in just heartbreaking ways in our long-term care homes. That would help. We could do that in Ontario. And it would help for um, long-term care and home care and chronic care or complex continuing care beds in hospitals that are you know, staffed by PSWs. But for the other beds, the acute care beds and so on, we need nurses and health professionals, respiratory therapists, MRI techs, you know, all of that. And they take longer to train. So the only option we have is to attract them back. The ones that have retired out early, the ones that have left, because they're burnt out. And that means they have to have workloads that can be done by a human being that are safe. They need to have some control over their schedules. They need to have protection from violence. Um, they need to have wages um, that reflect their value in our society. And, uh, and those things are doable, but they just are not being done. The government is intransigent on them. We, our read of this, I'm just going to close with this, sorry, <laughs> our read of this is that it's super serious. You know, the Ford government announced their plans. Uh, they came back, they called an extraordinary session of the legislature at the beginning of August. They don't usually sit in the legislature in August. They don't usually start till September. So right after the election, dead of summer, when it's guaranteed the least number of people are watching, um, and then they uh, announced they're going to privatize the hospitals, and then they bring in Bill 7, the one that forces the elderly out, uh, overrides their right to consent and forces the elderly out uh, into long-term care homes that could be up to, you know, 70 kilometers away in the south, 150 in the north, places that are not of their choosing. And, of course, the only ones that have beds are, like, the, the worst ones in the province, the ones that no one wants to go to. Um, and that's where they'll die. You know, that is where they will live the last months of their lives uh, and die. Not acceptable. But they did that in August, right after the election. So that's what governments do when it's their plan to get it in. You know, get it in with the least amount of public noticing. Try and get it done and in place long time before the next election. So people have hopefully forgotten. And it's the most undoable possible, right? 
at that point. This is very, very serious, but we can win. You know, we've stopped governments that were absolutely intent on privatizing before. We've saved dozens of local hospitals from closure. We saved the emergency departments in, oh gosh, in uh, Wallaceburg and Walpole uh, and uh, St. Joe's Island, the birthing unit in Midland and Leamington, the entire hospitals in uh, Port Colborne and Fort Erie, the thoracic cancer surgery in Windsor forced them to refund and open 60 beds in, in the Windsor Hospital, you know, play all across Ontario. We stopped the closure of the Mall 4 Hospital in Ottawa, you know, over and over. We've stopped governments that have tried to cut and privatize our public hospitals. If we move, all of us, and pour the pressure on, there is no question in my mind that we can stop the Ford government from doing this. But we should be pouring out into the streets over this. If we don't over this, what do we do it for? So we have some ideas. We want to hear yours tonight. And I just, does anyone remember Ralph Klein, the Premier of Alberta? This is back in the Mike Harris days. So these were the first provincial governments that really tried to undo the creation of the social safety net in Canada, you know, tried to create their revolution of, of cutting and privatizing and so on. And Ralph Klein came into government all macho and he blew up the Calgary hospital. He actually imploded the Calgary hospital. It was his, you can see it on video, it's online if you want to see it, it's very dramatic. And it was his message for his revolution. And they privatized the MRIs and CTs in Alberta. And our sister organization there, the Alberta Friends of Medicare, got all the patients who paid for medically necessary MRIs and CTs to, to bring their receipts, made um, complaints to the federal government, formal complaints. We held protests across the country, and they did across Alberta, and forced the Ralph Klein government to pay back all the patients that had paid for their MRIs in these private clinics. And then the government, you know, rolled, uh, built capacity in the public hospitals and ended that privatization. Well, when they tried to bring in a bill to privatize the hospitals, they held this major protest in the Alberta legislature. And I remember watching it on TV. There was a guy hanging from the banisters in the, in the, uh, from the gallery in the legislature. The legislature, the galleries were packed. And Shirley Douglas, whom some of you may know, she's the daughter of Tommy Douglas, who's the, known as the father of Medicare in Canada, a mom to uh, Kiefer Sutherland and, uh, and a, a famous actress in Canada. She was described the, the, what it looked like like this. She said, you know, the prairie is really flat, right? So you can see a long way. She said the cars were coming down the roads and down the highways across the prairie into the Alberta legislature to join the protest against the privatization of their public health care. And all you could see was lines and lines of car lights as far as the eye could see, you know? And in the end, Ralph Klein was forced to blink. He had to back off and he said public health care is the electric third rail of Canadian politics. You know how the train goes down the tracks and then there's a third rail that carries the electricity. Well, I always loved that. I thought, yes, let those bastards be afraid to touch our public health care. And what we're doing tonight, we're electrifying the third rail. Thanks for joining us. Wow, thanks a million, Natalie. That's just fantastic. And uh, throughout the chat, you'll see lots of people are saying, where can I get these slides? How can I get this information out? Is this recorded? Is it on YouTube? So yes, 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 and yes. It's all, uh, all of the, this information is available on ontariohealthcoalition.ca. It is a treasure trove. You pick your issue, if it's Bill 7, whatever, you'll find all of those fact sheets and information. But very importantly, there are uh, new resources coming out all the time on Facebook and Twitter. Share, share, share. Get that information out there. And if you've joined us tonight, you we have your email. We need you to get involved. And so we're going to get to that. Please don't anybody leave uh, because we're going to get to that shortly. We've had over 270 people on this call tonight. And it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic turnout. Also, in, in terms of the chat, there is so much uh, richness of suggestions, ideas, uh, 
hot takes on what is happening on Ford, et cetera. And uh, it, it's really uh, inspiring to see that we all, if we pull together, we can do something. For the past uh, few weeks, we've seen how Ford has been pushed back on a number of issues. And if you remember the press conference he did around the education workers and how completely miserable he looked, we can, we can do this again and we're gonna have to because the consequences just don't bear. Uh, thinking about if we fail to do that. So we have a few questions. Um, I, I think we're just uh, to make sure that we give ourselves enough time to talk about our action plan and how you can be involved. I'll just take, a, I'll just mention a few. Um, one question, uh, Anissa Karaskal said, uh, it was a, a, for Dr. Venegopal, but I think it's for all of our panelists um, to uh, weigh in on. Does it make it worse that the Ford government just removed funding to virtual clinics that were taking some pressure off of hospitals, especially for pedi pediatric care. So that would be good um, if anyone uh, does want to weigh in on that from our panel. Um, and as well, um, uh, the comment uh, that it's difficult to maintain and recruit nurses in community settings because of the low salaries, the community settings pay less than hospitals. And so there are multiple uh, problems that we're looking at um, and, and uh, uh, there are a couple of questions about uh, how do we get more pressure on uh, hospital management that doesn't seem to be responding to this. Is there a way to do that? And um, um, the question of how do we build uh, with different unions, because it seems that the uh, Ford government uh, is more interested in some of the private sector unions. That's an interesting question. And uh, in the chat, there's been a ton of stuff about uh, general strikes and, and all of these excellent ideas. Um, but uh, so does anyone um, from the panel want to say anything about the question of virtual um, uh, uh, the impact of uh, the, uh, the removal of the funding for virtual uh, clinics? Uh, Nicole's got her hand up. Go ahead, Nicole. Sorry, I'm having uh, issues with uh, pressing everything. I've got one hand here with Alexa. Um, it, it has impacted because think of it this way. Right now, SickKids is overwhelmed with regularly healthy children. Like they're typically healthy children that don't have medical complexities. And they're taking up beds from children who are regulars at SickKids that are like have medical complexities. So if you have access to the virtual um, emergency, you can actually triage through there. And some people that would typically have gone in person would not have uh, gone into the hospital. And then we would have had obviously less wait times in the eMERGE and not like 21 hours like we had in September. Like we didn't even go at the height of right now. So imagine in September it was 21 hours, right? So right now I can't even imagine where we're at and we're fortunate she's been home. So any type of resources that we can put in place to try to alleviate pressure on the actual emergency rooms um, is, is tremendous because again, um, you know, the, the children that can't go anywhere else and have to go to sick kids should be able to go to sick kids for care. So we support virtual care for sure, like as an add-on, but people should have a choice. And the issue with the for-profit virtual care companies um, is that they, um, like a whole array of them are charging for access to doctors and the government is actually not stopping them. So I went on to Maple a little while ago and I was like, did their little chat, you do a little chat and they, uh, I asked for a, a visit with a family doctor and they sent me a price list. Like you can't do that. Under the Canada Health Act, not allowed to charge people for access to a family doctor. That is outrageous. You know, not okay, not in any way. Uh, so we got to stop the for-profit, you know, virtual care companies. It would be, it's, you know, good if it's your family doc doing it. It's good if it's hopefully, you know, a, a service that is operating in the public interest. Thanks very much uh, for, for uh, those uh, responses. And I think uh, it's good to get this overall picture um, of how these different pieces fit together. Um, I guess at this point, um, we have, I, I feel like mostly what we're seeing in the chat, there are some questions about how do we uh, build on the links between the different campaigns that are going on uh, right now, uh, opposing the Ford government. Um, and I guess what I would say is that um, we have a particular task at hand, 
on the question of uh, sounding the alarm even louder than the Ontario Health Coalition has done so far, which has been very loud because if you looked at the editorial yesterday in the Toronto Star, fantastic editorial quoting the Ontario Health Coalition over and over again. It's fantastic work, but we can each play a role, letters to the editor, all of these things um, uh, that we're gonna have to do and literally getting out and talking to people one-on-one -on -one in our workplaces, in our communities, in our schools, to let people know what's happening. It's a, it's a very sneaky thing that they've done before the election. None of this was on, on the table. And, and afterwards, it was what Mike Harris did, which is hit him hard, hit him fast, do not blink. That is what, that's what we've seen the Ford government do in the past uh, couple of months. So what I would, uh, Riley, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about some of the action plan. There are different aspects to it. Um, one of them involves, uh, you know, basically signing everybody up here to be a whistleblower of a type. And the other one is that we need people to come out to uh, a rally, the first of what is going to be undoubtedly a series of bigger and bigger rallies um, to sound this alarm. Um, do you want to take that piece and, and talk about it? Yeah, I can. Um, uh, just a second, sorry. Uh, so yeah, so one of the first things that we really need to do here is if you go to the Ontario Health Coalition uh, website at ontariohealthcoalition.ca, you'll see right on our homepage, if you just scroll down uh, past the slideshow, uh, you'll see a sign-up sheet here, and it's not a sign-up for membership, even though it might look like one. What it is, is it's, it's a sign-up to show the Ford government how many people are opposed to privatizing our public hospitals, and to show that we have the support and he does not have a mandate to keep doing this, and to demand that he takes immediate action to fix this. Um, so we just launched this a few days ago, um, and we haven't really shared it too much with uh, anyone. Um, but if you go here, you can sign up. Uh, if you want to stay updated with the campaign and would like to know more and find out when there's a protest near you or any action you can get involved, you can click yes. But if you want to remain anonymous, you can, and you can just click no, and then we won't contact you or use your information for anything like that. Um, so you'll see that there's a tracker here, and I see some people from Toronto are signing up as we speak. Um, so that number, we need to get it up in the millions so we know for it we show for it that the cost of doing this or not doing this is too high for him to pay. Um, so we really, really need to push and get as many people signed up as we can to really, really make uh, an impact and scare them off, because uh, that's what we have to do. Um, once you do sign up, you will get an email, and that email will give you some more information on campaigns that you can start doing. Uh, so we're asking um, Medicare defenders, as we're calling people who signed up, um, we're asking them to hand out leaflets in their communities, at their workplaces, uh, uh, at their faith organizations, anywhere that they know people or even in their neighborhoods. Um, these leaflets, if you click here, um, it will give you more information and you'll see them here. Um, so the leaflet looks like this. You can just print it off and fold it in half uh, and then you can hand it out uh, wherever uh, you have connections. Uh, the second thing that you can do is we're actually asking for people to fill out a survey. So as Natalie said, um, there is options like what they did in Alberta, where uh, they can hold the province um, liable for uh, people being charged for health care that should be covered under the Canada Health Act. Um, so what we're asking for is people to fill in the survey here if they've ever been charged for things like a cataract surgery or a consultation with a doctor through Maple uh, to get one in the same day. Um, if they've been uh, told to pay extra fees for medical records or anything like that or at an endoscopy clinic, we're asking them to fill in the survey um, so that we can hold the government accountable for those fees that people are paying that they should not be paying. Uh, so if you uh, click on the button here, there's just the information to fill in. Uh, what did you pay? How old are you? Things like that. What were you charged for? Uh, anything like that. As much detail as you can provide, we can use it and build, uh, build that collection so that we can start holding the pro provincial government uh, liable for violating the CHA. Is there a direct link to the survey that we could share? Uh, yes. I'll put it in the chat in just a second. Um, and the last thing, as you'll see here, right now it is blank, um, but we are going to be listening, listening protests. 
Um, the one that we're going to go through in a second is for Toronto. It's on December 12th, and I'll pass that back to Natalie to talk about in more details. Uh, but we are having them across the province. I believe the first ones up are going to be Windsor, uh, Niagara, Ottawa, maybe Waterloo. Uh, these are ones that are going to be happening before the new year. In the new year, we're going to have many, many more. Uh, so if you keep your eyes peeled on this page, you'll see uh, it updated as they get settled, as we start to mobilize and grow. Um, so those are all the things that you can access just on our website. And if you've signed up for this meeting, um, I hope that you all take the time to sign up uh, and that we can stay in contact with you and really build build this pushback. I'll pass it back to Natalie now. Thanks, you. So, um, so like what Riley was showing you, that is the beginnings of the campaign to stop privatization. If people have been charged for um, services in private clinics, we want to gather that you can be anonymous or you can put your name to it. Um, we would like to make a formal complaint to the federal government to demand that they uphold the Canada Health Act and stop Ontario from doing this. There's a mechanism called a writ of mandamus. It's a court action. Um, they, there was a movement that, like ours that represented about half a million people in Quebec, and they did it, and they filed a writ of mandamus, and it, it's a court action to force the government to uphold its own legislation. Um, and so the, in Ontario, we have the commitment to the Future of Medicare Act, which bans um, these clinics and physicians charging extra user fees for health care. Um, and uh, but that is their profit. That is their business model. Right. They they do it. That's how they operate. And if they can't do that, then many of them will just close down. Uh, and uh, and so it's it's really quite serious. If we can do that, we could file a writ of mandamus at either level, provincial or federal or both. Um, we could do press conferences across the province with patients who've had to pay in private clinics. We can expose to Ontarians that the private clinics are a takeaway and not an add on, you know, to the public health system and so on. So it would be very, very useful. I'm thinking seniors groups would be great, retirees groups. Uh, community groups where people may have been charged. Uh, lots of people know someone who's been charged for cataract surgery, especially in Ontario. That's mostly where the Canada Health Act is being violated. So those are mechanisms. That and the million Medicare defenders are the mechanisms to stop the privatization. Where is that going? Well, you know, I hope that we will move to job action, real job action, because that would could stop it, um, and or a referendum. But a referendum, if we could get a million people to vote against the privatization of our hospitals in Ontario, it would stop any government. There's no question. I think we can do it, but we have to build to that. And so that's what we're trying to do there. The um, protest. I think we have to make this visible. Like we have to make it. What's happening is Ford is the master of the, the press conference where he just gives a PR line you know, and it sounds like they're doing something about it when they're not, right? And it puts the issue to bed for everyone. They need to see visible resistance. Ontarians need to see people saying the Ford government is doing nothing about this and instead privatizing our hospitals. We need that to be visible. And so we're asking for people, can we fill University Row in, you know, where all the hospitals are at, you know, UHN, the University Health Network, Mount Sinai, Sick Kids is there. Could we fill the median there? Could we pour, you know, down the sidewalks? Can we bring messages of support and love and respect for the healthcare, the hospital leadership and the staff who've done so much and just take Ford to task for doing nothing to support them and instead privatizing their services? I think it would be really powerful. Like I, we could bring flowers and candles and messages that we could leave, you know, down that whole boulevard, down the middle of University Row, so that people, ever, you know, the workers and so on in the hospital can see it. Patients would see it coming in and out, and then, um, you know, messages um, pairing that. So we're not just calling them healthcare heroes for a day and then disappearing, but like actually demanding that they get the support and resources they need and that he stop privatizing their services. So we wanted to do it Monday, December the 12th at noon. So we have like a busy hospital row and as many people like we, this is one where like it, it does actually count that you show up. It's big there. The buildings are big. The spaces are big, 
like we need a big, we can't have kind of a show of weakness. We'll work with the staff in the hospitals, the doctors, you know, Raghu Venugopal, who is here and all the docs who are down there, we'll ask them to, you know, help lead, we'll ask Karen and the nurses to help lead this and the unions QP and up Sue and all, all of the unions to help, um, but the public as well and the patient groups, Nicole, you know, we need everyone out there on force on December the 21st. And I was just wondering, are there, can we just see like by a show of hands or in the comments, are people willing to come and help to mobilize so we get, you know, something kind of monumental on that day? Oh yes, look at this. And that would be the start, right? This is the start where we just, you know, I don't want to use a military metaphor. What's a good, I didn't want to say a shot across the bow, but you know, where we like show the Ford government that he has woken the giant, you know, and that we are a force to be reckoned with. Um, and from there, we'll ratchet it up uh, in, in January. So if that's good, that's the plan. I think you're getting... A fairly look at this <laughs> a fairly overwhelming support and uh, and it's similarly so cool. for the sign up on the Defender Public Health Care uh, form we've had a terrific uh, response and uh, if you haven't had a chance to do it now you could do it later um, and we can send that out as well. Michelle, so, I forgot a couple of things. Riley has a list. Yeah, I go think we it. wanted to make banners, right? For ban like we could drop banners on the bridges over the Don Valley Parkway on that day as well super visible riley you've got a list do you sorry yeah. michelle i didn't mean to interrupt i just didn't want to forget yeah so uh one of the things that we want to do is do a banner drop on the dvp um so i think we've identified that there's a good bridge at winford drive and what we need to do is make a huge banner something that anyone driving by would not be able to miss uh, so we're looking at making something like 25 or 30 feet long um, so if anyone would like to volunteer to help paint, um, uh, we've got some volunteers who have some interest in it already. I'm not very artistic, but hopefully some of you guys are. Um, if you could just write in the chat uh, that you would like to volunteer to paint, we can have a little painting party. We can also make our own protest signs at the same time. Um, so if you want to volunteer to paint, um, we can arrange details about like where we can meet and when we can meet then too. Um, just write in the chat and we'll follow up with you uh, about the time and place uh, and logistics then. Uh, so that's the first thing that we need volunteers for is painters and people with artistic ability because I don't have it. <laughs> um, and what else was on that list that you and I talked about this after? The second thing that we have to do is we have to get a group of organizers. We need people who are going to be able to do leafleting, are going to, uh, as people said in the chat, uh, go outside of subway stations and hand out flyers. Uh, we need people posting on Reddit. We need people who are part of organizations, churches, to reach out to all their members. Uh, so if you would like to be involved and be an organizer, uh, please write in the chat as well, and we'll invite you to a meeting, uh, and we'll see how best we can work together to really make this as big as possible. Um, so uh, if you could also write in the chat, I volunteer as an organizer. Uh, we'll get that set up with you as soon as we can, too. So there are Wasn't lots there... of responses oh, in the chat. Uh, so uh, that's fantastic. And keep it coming. Oh, and uh, people are asking, and this is a question for Natalie and uh, Riley. Let's see if we can. Uh, can you mute David Pavelka's uh, mic? Yeah. Um, oh, thank you. Okay, uh, just um, we, we uh, people want to know, will they get all of the details sent back to them because they registered for this event? So uh, Riley or Natalie, can you come back on that? Yes, uh, we're going to be sending out uh, the recording for tonight, as well as um, all of the details uh, about any subsequent action that people can take um, out as soon as we can, probably tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. And um, I think there was another thing, which was people who are good at social media and like, so we're on Twitter and TikTok, Reddit now, just recently, uh, Insta, Instagram, sorry, and Facebook. So, but we need more content. Like it's, we can't keep up with generating the content, but there's lots of people who can. And um, also some of those apps are like our platforms are 
uh, really used by younger people as well. And, you know, so anyone that wants to help like create content and gets up first, you don't have to wait for us, just do it. But, you know, all the resources that you need are on our website likely, but we can help as well, right? And the Toronto Health Coalition is really an amazing group. So there's also a lot of resources there uh, for people if they want to do that. And maybe you could indicate like if you're kind of into helping build the sort of social media word to get stuff out far and wide in Toronto, that would be amazing. This is great. There's so many questions in the chat. What is the <laughs> subreddit? <laughs> That's a question I had as well. Um, all right. So uh, with all of those things, this fantastic numbers of volunteers for making banners, for handing out leaflets, for going online and sharing stuff. Um, I see a bunch of hands that are raised uh, still. Are those people who uh, would like to speak or uh, are they still raised from? Uh, I see. Yes. They are raised because people were saying, yes, I want to volunteer and help. Perfect. Um, the, so the Ontario Health Coalition is uh, has has local coalitions all across the province. In the GTA area, there's the uh, Greater Toronto Health Coalition, which is newly uh, pulled together. There was a Toronto Health Coalition. We're part of the GT, GT Health Coalition now, and uh, we'll be having ongoing organizing meetings. So all of these things, I think we're going to send you Here's what's going on. Here's the plan. And here's how, if you want to be involved in the Greater Toronto Health Coalition, click, click this box. If you just want to get emails about what upcoming activities, you'll get that. And if you want to share the tonight's the video from tonight's um, event, you can do that. There's so many other things that you can do. Um, I'm, I see that we're coming up on, on uh, 8.30. We've been, we thought we'd do this for about an hour and a half. Are there other um, things that we need to... Uh, let people know about uh, immediately Natalie or Riley. By the way, Natalie has been doing these. She was on another meeting earlier tonight, but these are happening all across the province. And you know what? You you shouldn't feel like you can only go on the Toronto one. It's a very interesting to see what's going on in different parts of the province. And it's inspiring and also gives, gives us ideas about how we can, um, you know, uh, uh, cross fertilize and stuff like that. Um, but what else uh, would you like to convey tonight, uh, Natalie and Riley, or any of the other panelists? I feel like we've I've spoken a lot and just like I'm so thrilled like I'm watching this chat too and all the people here it's really exciting I I feel really hopeful it really matters you know it matters that we do stuff all across Ontario but I tell you if if it doesn't happen in Toronto no one like the media doesn't realize it happens doesn't reach the provincial level media it doesn't get out to everyone across the province in the same way you so matter and so this this is really really exciting thank you very much <laughs> and uh, uh i'm wondering if uh, charles if you have any thoughts uh, you've heard what everybody has to say i mean from your perspective is there anything you want to leave us with um, as someone who's in the paramedic uh, field. I think it's wonderful that people are getting together for this. Um, I mean, there's a lot of talk about private privatization. And uh, from my our point of view, um, it's very obvious that the, the people we serve in the community can't afford private hospitals. Uh, more than 50, more, more than 70% of the people we, uh, we service to every day um, are in no position to afford private care. So it's not gonna change um, the type of service they're gonna get, right? People are still gonna be going to the hospitals and the hospitals are gonna be overloaded and the system is obviously broken. So any type of support that we can get to change things would greatly appreciate and this is amazing. Fantastic. Thanks so much for participating tonight. And Nicole, did you have any final words that you wanted to share with people here tonight? I just want to thank everyone. Here's Alexa, my daughter. She's off her ventilator right now, so we're giving her a little break. But I just wanted to say thank you, everyone, for all of your support, uh, for joining and doing everything. Um, we're trapped at home. We can't do anything physically, but knowing that we have all of your support and you're all jumping in and representing us, just remember, Alexa, when you're doing that, that you're helping a child like her and that it makes a huge difference and that your support is... I don't know how I can put into words. I'm just so grateful. So thank you so much for helping us out. Thank you. 
Thank you, Nicole, and for all the work that you're doing. It's uh, remarkable, and we're really glad you were here with us tonight for this for this meeting, that launching this action. Karen, did you want to uh, come back on any of the stuff we've discussed? Hi, I just want to shout out to Nicole how brave you are, and your your story is compelling. And I, God love you. Nurses are overworked. And I know, it's I'm not so sustainable. <laughs> oh my God, I know, I you know them. how we feel. I love I my nurses. That. Oh my God. Um, they're, they're, I don't think people understand. Um, like the thing is, is that when you're a parent of a, a child who's, who's this fragile and has these medical complexities, as a frontline worker, you're not ex like, it's not ethical to work on family members. There's that line you don't cross. With Families with children with medical uh, complexities, um, that line is crossed all the time because there's this expectation that the parents will jump in and provide care when we have no experience. Like I'm not a nurse, I have no medical background, but yet I'm doing medical interventions on my child. And so our lifeline is those nurses, those home care nurses that come into our home and provide us a break <laughs> and provide yes. us support. And I count the minutes. I count the minutes when they come home uh, to my home and take care of my child and they become part of my family. This whole mess that this <laughs> government has created right now has created a situation where there's no continuity of care. It's a revolving door of, you know, I'm, I'm, I have four agencies that I'm pulling nurses from. I have five sources of funding to provide 24 hour care for my child. It's exhausting <laughs> and it's like, there's no end in sight. I don't think they're understanding the uh, tremendous mental health, um, um, I guess, issues that it creates for us because like, it's, it's overwhelming. So just knowing that you're, you're there and just know that we, we're so grateful for the work that you do, all frontline workers, uh, because we can't do it alone. <laughs> we need you guys so much. So when you're burning out and everything, we're thinking of you. So if anybody is a nurse, uh, who's burnt out in hospitals, please go into home care, please. We need you guys. <laughs> a lot of families don't have any nurses at all right now. That's so I don't true. want to pitch that out, but no, I'm one of the lucky um, ones because I'm resourceful, but there's a lot of families with absolutely no nurses right now and it's devastating. So just take that into consideration because we're so grateful for any help we can get. Wow. I've got nothing. It's, it's you know what, it's it's not sustainable. And, you know, the solution is we have to invest in our public health care. We, we have to stop this and its tracks. And you know what? We will be out there on December 12th with Natalie and everybody else. You That's have fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. And, uh, and uh, it goes both ways. Um, the support is there for the nurses as well. Um, I know that uh, there are a couple of hands up. I'm wondering if... Um, if people have questions, would they mind? Uh, are they able to type them in? I'm just worried that we won't be able to get to everything right now. And because it is really getting close to what uh, our closing time was for this meeting. Um, and, and instead of having it dwindle, uh, I see that our numbers are dropping already. Um, uh, Salvatore, uh, uh, can, are you able to type in the question? Because I'm wondering if we could come back if there are questions that are... Um, no, I just simply wanted to, to say that Bill 124 was considered unconstitutional today. Yes, yes. We, so uh, how does that affect what we're trying to do? I know they'll appeal it, but if it if it's found wanting, they're going to have to sink billions of dollars into the health system. Yes. And uh, I've got, uh, Kemi, do you want to go ahead? Hi there. Thank you. One question I have is, um, you know, Toronto, in the way we voted in the most elections, we didn't vote um, by and large for the PC party. What's the reaction um, from other uh, municipal health coalitions where they do have a conservative MP in place, yet are being significantly impacted by what's happening within the healthcare system? And I think I saw Deanna's hand as well. Uh, Deanna, do you want to go ahead or? And I think that will be our list. Oh, your mic is off. I'm not hearing you. Okay. Okay. 
Does anyone want to come back on these uh, these last questions on Bill 124? And sorry, we'll send out um, like a bit of an update about Bill 124 tomorrow. I need to figure out exactly what the I have not had a chance yet to see exactly what the four government is saying that they're going to do, and we need to make sure that it's like we have to check the facts and all of that stuff and it's so, so once we know it's so brand new once we know we can send uh something out i mean bill 124 is part of it for sure but it's not the full answer and we've got this problem that they just are intransigent right on doing it very much of anything um so it's a piece uh and if they are going to appeal it it will delay even longer which i think is their intention so um but we'll see I didn't catch the municipal question, sorry. Sorry, I was just wondering um, for the municipalities that do have an MPP within the Conservative Party, yet their constituents are. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, sorry. I accidentally muted you. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know what is happening with my Zoom. It's usually on my work computer. It was us, don't <laughs> Oh, okay, no worries. Um, what is actually like how are those who voted this government in or you know in those regions that do have a conservative mp what is the response from the communities there in terms of how what their decisions have led to do they see the crisis are they um you know questioning or going to their mpps yeah, so I mean, we're holding town halls in places like Clinton and Seaforth, Chesley, those are in the Southwest right now. Um, these are places that have had their merge departments closed, some of them over and over, some of them still closed down. They're now at risk of losing them. And of course, you lose your merge, you lose your local hospital. It's not a hospital anymore. Uh, they're very, very worried. In, in um, Chesley, there were a thousand people came out to a town hall meeting. Um, but the issue is, they don't quite know who to blame, like whether it's the local hospital CEO or the Ford government. So we've been holding meetings to, you know, it's a bit of both in some in a number of the cases to try and kind of lay out the facts and what's happening. Um, and it is true, some of those are amalgamated hospitals and the local hospitals see leadership may be more than happy to close down the emerges in some of the small sites. Um, and so there's like two layers. But, uh, but, you know, there's no question when rural Ontario realizes that their hospitals are at risk, that, you know, they will turn. And actually, the last few elections, um, you know, we had sort of a minority liberal government. We had like Tory liberal, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of those, riding, those ridings swung, have swung back and forth between and definitely you know the attacks on their local public hospitals we fought them off every single time we'll save them again but you know it is i mean it's ridiculous to have to do this over and over again but uh you know they they have shift back and forth between generally between those two parties but we're not getting out of out of the general track which is austerity budgets cuts and privatization you know even if we fight off the worst we're still you know, a few steps back. We need to move forward now. It's been too long in which, you know, we need to expand. I think we need a much more ambitious strategy. Like we need to demand what we need, which is actually an expansion. It's not just to keep what we have, which isn't working. So um, anyway, we, we, we need to move to that. But yeah, people are waking up just, um, we need to mobilize them. We need to make it visible and the resistance mm -hmm. there. That's all. I just wanted, I forgot, Michelle and Carolyn, Michelle Robodeau, Robodeau, sorry, and Carolyn Egan have been the co-chairs of the Toronto Health Coalition for literally decades. They're wonderful and they are both here and they are instrumental in all of this and Riley as well. I don't want to leave without just saying a really huge heartfelt thanks. They're heroes. They never stop and all they do all kinds of other things as well that are amazing for the world and the community. And Riley, our staff person who's working with the Toronto Health Coalition, is just a gem. So heartfelt thanks and <laughs> lots of credit to you. Well, I want to actually, now that you uh, mentioned this, yes, thank you, Riley, for all of the uh, the behind the scenes efforts that go on all the time for uh 
for the Health Coalition and especially for the GTA, but I also want to acknowledge other people who helped build tonight, who did the phoning, who did a fantastic job getting people out, uh, Feline Bobier, uh, Lindsay, Barbara, Ginny, and I think there might be a few others I've forgotten, but your work has been vital and every single one of us here can take up a piece of that. I think it, you know, many hands make light work. And so that's the idea that we're gonna have a much bigger impact if we can just take each a little piece of this and, and start working where we are. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. So uh, I think, uh, you know, on that note, uh, we have our, our work cut out for us, uh, but this has been a really inspiring evening. I'm so thrilled that everybody uh, who came out, we had uh, 275 people by my count, uh, possibly a few more here and there, but uh, uh, thank you to the speakers. Thank you to everyone who's struggling with this healthcare system. We all have our, our, uh, our stories of difficulties we're having, but the fact that we're ready to fight back and do something about it, and do what the education workers have been, you know, had successfully did, and uh, and now um, with Bill 124, we should feel there's a bit of a wind in our sails um, because this government we know has uh, just barely above 17% of actual actual potential voters voted for these uh, conservatives. So we we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't for forget that we shouldn't lose sight of it, and uh, it does make a difference to mobilize. So off we go. Uh, on Monday, December 12th, that's our next time we're going to get together in between now and then. Please get onto all of those uh, platforms, share widely. If you like the event tonight and want other people to see it, the, the YouTube uh, recording will go out um, in the next, I'm sure in the next uh, day or two. Today is Wednesday. So by the end of the week, we should be able to get everything out to people. And uh, on that note, Let's go forward. Let's uh, let's do this. We we can do it, and we must do it. Thanks again, everyone.